the evolution of choice in computer games. Some of the earliest forms of computer games were interactive fiction. These were direct transplants of choose your own adventure stories to the electronic medium. Games like that were characterized by showing the world by text descriptions, exactly as books do, and taking user input by text passes. The number of possible actions available to the player in each situation are greater than with printed text, however, as befits the greater flexibility a computer has over a book in presenting information. Of course, the freedom of text passes led to users trying all sorts of commands, and part of the charm of such games lay with developers catering to such queries with often humorous responses. The outcomes of those choices are still often fixed, as they are likely to be eaten by a group meme from Zork tests. Once graphics became sufficiently advanced, games could display what the character saw instead of describing it by text. They weren't great, particularly by today's standards, but they were critical in making these types of games more readily accessible to the general public than a text format could possibly be. King's Quest was instrumental in ushering in that change. Further quest series like Space Quest and Police Quest quickly followed, together with additional entries to the King's Quest series. Along the way, the text passing was replaced with a point-and-click interface, making the games even more accessible. Many of the series that came to be in this period I remember fondly to this day, and now then graphically, many still hold up very well. The various Monkey Islands, Day of the Tentacle, Full Throttle, and Grim Fandango are all examples of games of that era that have seen remasters or graphical updates in more recent years. Fundamentally, interactive fiction, graphical, and point-and-click adventure games were all based on exploration and puzzle solving. You have a world to explore, sometimes partitioned into segments by roadblocks. Items are placed within the accessible world that have specific uses, including removing roadblocks to access other parts of the game world. However, they don't have any purpose beyond that. Things that exist in the world but don't have a game purpose simply appear as part of the background image instead of being items that the character can manipulate. Other characters may exist and be available for interaction in some manner to advance the narrative. The player is placed within this world and permitted to explore as they will. Sometimes, they may be given hints or directions, but it is up to the player whether they recognize them. Ultimately, the player must obtain a collection of items that the game requires in order to resolve puzzles and advance the game's narrative. Items are unique to a purpose and placed deliberately by the developer in order to reward exploration. How precisely a player arrives to the solution is not predetermined, and items may be obtained in any order. As a result, a player may choose to wander around and explore every part of the accessible world before resolving puzzles. Or they may solve puzzles as they come to find them and thereby end up simultaneously exploring and solving puzzles. In addition, not all activities available need to be finished in order to beat the game. Many, if not most, are entirely optional and purely for the satisfaction of the player. And in order to encourage the player to explore, these games often had a score that increased as you perform tasks. Arguably, the pinnacle of the graphical adventure games format was the Quest for Glory series. It retained the puzzle solving aspects of earlier games, but extended the gameplay significantly by adding elements from tabletop role playing systems. Most important of these were abilities and classes for the player. No longer was the character always the same. Now you could be a warrior solving problems head-on and by a fighting prowess, a mage, utilizing magic to achieve his goals, or a thief, who used his abilities to work around obstacles. However, the genius of the design was that you weren't limited by your class, unlike tabletop RPGs, but by your individual abilities and you could invest in abilities outside your class. Want to be a magic casting warrior? You can do that. Want to be a sneaky warrior? You can do that. Want to be a thieving mage? Easy. That is not impossible in tabletop RPGs, but it's far easier to actualize in a computer format. It wasn't just cosmetic either, the games explicitly catered for all three types of characters in the story. Most problems could be solved through a number of different ways. Not only that, abilities improved through use rather than by levels. That was a key innovation in The Elder Scrolls, another legendary series that would come later towards the end of the decade. There were many other factors such as day-night cycles, a world that revolved without the player's intervention, survival mechanics, to name a few, that made the series the landmark that it was. However, we will not be discussing this in depth in this video. Suffice to say that the Quest for Glory series was not lacking design in comparison to more recent games. The other major branch of gaming were those that focused on action gameplay. Games focused on fast reactions, characterized by the player typically taking on waves of enemies. Such games dominated arcades with shoot em ups like 1942, beat em ups like Double Dragon, and fighting games like Street Fighter. At this time, personal computers were unable to equal the capabilities that arcades could offer with their dedicated hardware, so arcades were the leaders in this field. However, the PC continued to develop. The key breakthrough was ID Software's Wolfenstein 3D, a simulated 3D environment using 2D sprites rather than true 3D. 
where the player took on a horde of World War II German soldiers on their way to the final bosses. Following that was Doom, which advanced its technology further. Doom in particular moved the goalposts of consumer expectation for PC games further ahead than they'd ever been. After Doom, it was requisite for similar games to be able to provide fast action in a 3D environment, even if 2D sprites were still used for characters in it. Within this branch of gaming, the choices were mostly restricted to where you moved your avatar, what weapon you could use, where you chose to aim, and when you chose to shoot. There were usually limitations such as health, ammunition, or armor. All of the options and limitations are related to combat, which of course was the focus of the game. From this point onwards, these two main branches of gaming began to merge. First person shooters began to add RPG elements, such as abilities that players could acquire, or stories that earlier games like Doom had eschewed. Half Life was a seminal entry within the FPS genre, precisely because it added a story that engaged the player in it, albeit a story that was more cinematic than interactive. Most modern FPSs and similar shooters followed the basic design of Half Life. It's important to note that the choices available to the player were not significantly expanded beyond what was available in Doom or even arcade games. The quality of graphics and story exposition has significantly improved, but the core of the choices available to the player hasn't done so. Some innovations have been added on occasion. Red Faction Guerrilla was famous for its fully destructible buildings. More realistic shooters like Armor have linear mechanics like those System Shock pioneered. But generally, such innovations haven't taken hold and the player choice formula is relatively the same as it was at the birth of the genre. That's not to say that action doesn't have its merits. There's always something to be said for adrenaline filled combat and that's the reason why it's by far the most common form of gaming. An interesting development of player choice in FPSs is cosmetic choice. It has zero gameplay value, but people have always been attracted to being able to customize the look and feel of their avatars. The development of the cosmetic microtransaction market, where players pay real world money for cosmetic customizations, demonstrates the demand that exists for player choice within this space. Role playing games and narrative games in turn started to move towards 3D environments with varying levels of success. For instance, the fifth and last entry in the Quest for Glory series was set in a 3D world. Ultima moved to a 3D environment in Ultima Underworld, and the Elder Scrolls series independently arrived at the same destination. System Shock and Deus Ex still reverberate in modern game design to this day. Prior to this point, RPG genre games tended to be top-down isometric. The player saw the party from above and moved them on the virtual equivalent of a map. Fundamentally, they had the same qualities as graphical adventure games. The environment was a painting, and items didn't exist as discrete items unless they were usable to the player. The difference was combat, so such games mirrored fighting fantasy books rather than the choose your adventure books that graphical adventure games were based off. The move to 3D environments increased the possibilities beyond what isometric games could offer. Maybe. Items are now discrete objects within the world, but their use is still generally restricted to gimmicks like Skyrim's well-known bucket exploit. It was amusing, but it's worth highlighting that the bucket exploit also required NPC vision to originate from the head and take into account the objects in between to determine whether something is visible or not. Bethesda could have easily done something simpler, like using distances and tests for unbroken straight lines between the player and the NPC to simulate vision, but they didn't. That is a fundamental building block that can be extended on in the future. You might have the option to blindfold NPCs for instance, and if you forget to do so then important information may be revealed. Most modern games are an amalgam of the two branches. To varying degrees, they include the graphical fidelity and responsiveness of the FPS branch together with the narratives and characterization of RPGs. Different games have different levels of these qualities, but they all share at least some from both sides of the spectrum. As the medium moves into the virtual reality format, we should not be surprised if player choice options continue to expand as controls develop further. For instance, the demonstration gameplay videos released for Alex, the new Half-Life installment, showed the ability to open car doors to use as shields in firefights and the use of a stool to repel a leaping headcrab. That's not something that could be done smoothly with keyboard and mouse or controllers. We're still in the infancy of exploring the possibilities available to us through true 3D environments, but it wouldn't be a stretch to say that the player's own attributes and the player's own skills will be used in combination with the character's abilities, whereas in the past it was far more likely that the character's abilities would be the sole determinant of success or failure. Puzzles and other activities like lockpicking will become far more interactive. Same with crafting and maintenance. Even something as trivial as reloading a gun can become an interesting activity. Once freed from the limitations of our current input schemes, the possibilities for player choice will expand rapidly. I look forward to that, even if my computer can barely run Crisis.
Thanks for watching all the way to the end. Let me know what you thought about it in the comments. Feel free to leave a like, subscribe and hit the bell button to be notified when new videos come out. See you soon.